Zie je toch hier ook tijd op je Precies. Dat is ook lastig hoor. Precies. One of the most commonly known chemistry facts is the freezing temperature of water. Basically, anyone can tell you that at zero degrees temperature, water will freeze. However, what if I told you this doesn't always have to be the case? There is a state of water called a supercooled state in which the water is below zero degrees Celsius but has not yet frozen. But what if I told you this isn't even the strangest part about this? Let's take a closer look at this state. So what is happening here? To really understand what is going on, we first have to become familiar with the concept of the Gibbs free energy, which we write as G, and the analysis of the system with this concept. Basically, the rule is the a system in nature always wants the lowest state in G. If we take a look at a graph of the Gibbs free energy plot as a function of temperature, things will probably become a bit more clear. Here we see the normal phase transitions of water. We see that if the temperature is below zero degrees Celsius, the red line marking the Gibbs free energy of the solid state of water is below the Gibbs free energy of the liquid state of water. So to have the lowest Gibbs free energy, the system wants to become a solid. This is kind of to be expected, because normally we always see that water below zero degrees Celsius is a solid, which we call ice. If we have liquid water below this temperature with a volume V and it freezes, then we'll write the decrease in Gibbs free energy as delta G equals minus V times G0, where we call G0 the difference in Gibbs free energy between the solid state and the liquid state of water per unit volume. But we're missing a term here, because in order to make this volume of ice, the system first has to make a boundary between ice and water. Because you have this boundary between ice and water, you get a surface tension between those two regions. These two effects, the breaking up the structure of the hydrogen atoms and the surface tension, give an increase in Gibbs free energy linearly with the surface of the ice. If we take the case the ice forms in a sphere, we can then write the change in Gibbs free energy as delta G equals minus 4 third times pi times r to the third times g0 plus 4 pi r squared gamma. If we look in the picture of the radius of the ice sphere formed, plotted against the difference of the Gibbs free energy, we'll see that after r, the radius of the sphere has become bigger than some critical radius here, the Gibbs free energy will only lower the bigger the sphere becomes, and with that, the more ice is formed. For radii lower than a critical radius, forming of ice doesn't give any Gibbs free energy lowering for the water. So, some small sphere of ice that is formed in the water won't last long, even though the water is at temperature below zero degrees Celsius. So, when water is supercooled, so it's liquid and it's below zero degrees Celsius, it's in a so-called metastable state. It's in a minimum of the Gibbs free energy, but only in a local minimum. It still can get a lower Gibbs free energy if it freezes instead of remains liquid. We now know that water can start to freeze if by chance the dynamic water molecules in the liquid form a crystal bigger than a critical radius R star. This process is called homogeneous nucleation. We'll see the water freeze much faster at timescales that we're used to if we somehow can lower that Gibbs free energy barrier between the forming of water and ice. Well, this exactly can happen if there is less surface between the ice and water, but the volume of the ice stays the same. If the ice then forms on a surface that is already present in the water, for example, some sort of mineral or the bottle of whatever water is in, then this barrier is substantially lower. The process that ice then forms in water and turns the water into ice is called heterogeneous nucleation. Now, let's take a look at a system that seems very different, but actually has a lot of the same physics going on. Namely, the well-known mendelssohn coe experiment. With the many viral videos and the few programs covering the subject, the reaction that mendelssohn coe have is well documented and well known. However, it seems that many people know what the actual reason for this reaction is. A look online at Yahoo Answers seems to suggest that most people think it is chemical by nature. But, as you might suspect from watching this video, it is actually nothing of the sorts. It's again just a case of heterogeneous nucleation. It's again all about decreasing the surface on which a phase of the liquid can nucleate. Give the carbon dioxide within the coke a place to turn into gas, and it will. And if we take a closer look at the mantles, we can actually see this candy provides the perfect place for this. 
The mantles, in close-up, is covered with tiny craters all over, which all give a place where the Gibbs-free energy barrier is lowered. When you drop mantles into coke, the craters all continuously, as the mantles sinks into the coke, give rise to carbon dioxide bubbles that float up to the top of the bottle, making room for more bubbles to form. More and more bubbles form so rapidly and in such a big number that they at some point literally push the liquid out of the bottle, making the signature Coke Mentals Geyser. So what we learned today is phase transitions aren't as spontaneous as you might have thought. Most cases, nature need needs a little help by impurities or a little shock to get things going. We're Tim, Jesper, Wouter. We hope you enjoyed this video. Stay curious.